Good evening and welcome. Bonsoir et bienvenue. I am Harvey Slack, a proud trustee of the Ottawa Public Library Board, and I am delighted to be with you here this evening. Kate Kwai Kakina, we believe it is important to acknowledge that even as we gather virtually, we are on the unceded and ancestral territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin people. Many diverse nations, First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples now live, work and study in this territory. Nous rendons hommage à toutes les premières nations, les Inuits et les Métis, leurs années, leurs ancestres et leurs importantes contributions passées et présentes. On behalf of the Ottawa Public Library, I want to thank our partner in this event, the Ottawa International Writers Festival. We are pleased that you have all joined us this evening for a conversation with author Mona Awad about her new novel, All's Well. If you haven't read it yet, you can borrow All's Well at a library branch near you. And you can check out her other wonderful books, such as Bunny and 13 Ways of Looking at a Fat Girl. I would like you to invite you to the Ottawa Public Library again on Wednesday evening, as we welcome Jenny Buckshot Tanasco, a residential school survivor who attended a residential school in Kenora, Ontario, when she was six years old. Through storytelling, Jenny and her daughter, Anita Tanasco, members of the Kitty Ganzibi Anishinaabeg community, will share some thoughts and reflections on how Canada's residential school system has impacted First Nation communities. That virtual event will happen Wednesday at 7 p.m., so tune in again. Remember, you can always visit the Ottawa Public Library website to find more about our upcoming programs and to access the wide range of content and resources that come with a library card. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce Kazigo Lazeko Molope from the Ottawa International Writers Festival to say a few words. Thank you and have a great evening. Merci et bon soirée. And over to you, Kesiko. Thank you, Harvey. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Kahiso Lisohomolope, and we are broadcasting from the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe. On behalf of the Writers Festival, I'm thrilled to welcome you all to tonight's conversation between Francesca Eguiasi and Mona Wood. I want to thank you for supporting authors and booksellers through these difficult times. Our official bookseller is Perfect Books on Elgin Street in Ottawa. And I know that wherever you are right now, there's an independent bookseller nearby who'd be more than happy to sell you some great books. I also want to thank the Ottawa Public Library, the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, the City of Ottawa, the Ontario Arts Council, the Canada Council of the Arts, Carleton University and CBC for their ongoing support. We've got lots of great events coming up. I hope you'll join us tomorrow to spend time with Katharina Vermetti and our guest on Wednesday is Kamal al Soleili. And next week, I'll be hosting Essie Edujan. So there's lots to look forward to. The festival is supported by generous individuals like you. So I hope you'll consider subscribing to our newsletter and making a donation to support our ongoing programming and children's literacy initiatives. We can't do this without you. Our host tonight is 2021 Canada Reads finalist, Francesca Eguiasi. Her best-selling novel, Butter, Honey, Pig Bread was long listed for the Scotiabank Gila Prize and was a finalist for the Governor General's Literary Award the Amazon Canada First Novel Award, and the Lambda Literary Award. Let's give a warm virtual welcome to our host this evening, Francesca Eguiasi. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so honored to be here. So thank you for inviting me to host. I'm so, so excited to be in conversation today with Mona Awad. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read her bio because it's incredibly impressive and I think we should take time to acknowledge it. Um, Mona Awad is the author of Bunny, named a best book of, the two, of 2019 by Time, Vogue, and the New York Public Library. 
It was a finalist for the New England Book Award and the Goodreads Choice Award. It is currently in development for film with Jenny Connor and New Regency Productions. I'm very excited for that. Um, Awards first novel, 13 Ways of Looking at a Fast Girl, was a finalist for the Scotiabank Giller um, and winner of the Colorado Book Award and the Amazon Canada First Novel Award. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, Vogue, McSweeney, Plowshare, and elsewhere. She teaches fiction in the Creative Writing Program at Syracuse University. Her novel, All's Well, has been named a best or most anticipated book of summer by Entertainment Weekly, O Magazine, Goodreads, and many more. <laughs> um, welcome, Mona Awad. I'm so thrilled to, to meet you. Uh, thank you so much, Francesca. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be speaking with you tonight, and um, and thank you to um, to the festival for 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 inviting us. Um, this is really really great. I, I have to apologize in advance. I think my Wi-Fi is a little unstable, so if I freeze, um, hopefully I'll just come back on and and all will be good. But the the, the life on Zoom, unfortunately, it's one of the is terrible life. hazards of it. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I think at this point, we all sort of have to make peace with that reality. Yes, um, sadly. <laughs> so that was your short bio that I read. <laughs> I want to ask how you like to introduce yourself. Um, I, that's a great question. Uh, I, I really do, um, I guess, just see myself as, as sort of just a, a, I don't know, a storyteller, somebody who just loves loves telling stories, loves, um, and loves engaging with, with writers and with readers. I mean, I think part of the reason why I love to write is just because I love to connect with people and it's my way, it's the introvert's way of connecting with people. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Um, I, now the second question actually just flows perfectly because I want to know how you came to storytelling. Oh, I came to storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just as as a you mean as like a, as a kid and, and yeah, as a kid um, and yeah. I mean and how that you know whatever that desire was, how that propelled you now into a career as like a critically acclaimed and like very beloved author. Yeah, I was uh, I was really um, quite shy as a child and um, spent a lot of time on my own. Um, I was I was an old child, and um, my mother used to take me with her to work. Uh, she was, you know, single mother, and so I, you know, and she would just kind of sit me in the back of like the restaurant where she worked, and just like you know, gave me like these paper placemats. And I remember I would write on them. I would write space to entertain myself, um, and that's where I really kind of got got into it because I would just disappear into these other worlds, um, and then I just loved. I loved reading too, and I especially loved like Alice in Wonderland and The Wizard of Oz. Um, and I would, I remember I lived on Nuns Island in Montreal um, and I would go like walking around the island looking for like a way to Oz, looking for like a way to Wonderland. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, um, I think very early on, I loved, I loved the idea of kind of escaping into this other place. And then later on as a teenager, when I got very, very shy, it was a place of rebellion for me. The page became that that sort of space, a place where I actually had a voice and I could say whatever I wanted, um, you know. And there was there was no one to kind of like tell me that I couldn't do it. So it became a place of agency, and that was very exciting to me um, because it was very very hard for me to to speak my my mind. Um, and I think I I I I was I think in stories. So that's the way I, I speak my mind, you know? Um, so yeah, I think those two things, just that kind of kid, like notion of play and then the, the rebellion thing as a teenager, for sure. Um, before I get carried away, because I'm very selfishly wanting to just steal all your attention and ask you all my questions. Um, I want to uh, welcome all the everyone attending today and let them know that they're welcome to ask questions and I'll ask, just throughout this conversation. And you can do so using the Q&A function. 
Um, yeah, so I'll be asking my questions <laughs> and I invite everyone else to do the same. <laughs> um, you said you think in stories and I, I hear that. I hear you because I think I was trying to write a, state, a statement for um, a fellowship and I was trying to say what I meant because I, I, I wrote, I believe everyone is a storyteller. And I was like, wait, what do I mean by that? And it's just, it's kind of how we make sense of the world. We just have a bunch of theories and we're yeah. just like, oh, that must have happened because this happened. That's just fiction that may or may not be true. Right, <laughs> right, um, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm wondering if you remember your first short story or your first kind of, oh. yeah, your, fir your first fiction that you came up with. I think the really exciting one um, was uh, it, as, a, as a teenager, um, I dropped out of high school a few times. It was really, really hard for me to stay in school. It kind of felt like jail in like a weird way. Um, and uh, and they, so I, I loved reading, but I didn't really get into, I didn't really get into reading in school, but it was in school later um, in, uh, in university that I heard this poem. Um, this poem called Howl by Allen Ginsberg um, that I just loved. I loved hearing it. It was just so powerful. Um, and I, I took so much inspiration from it. I decided to kind of write my own howl. Um, I don't know if my connection, on, it says my connection's unstable. Can you still hear me and follow me? I can, me? I I can good? hear you, okay. yeah. Okay, good, good, good. Um, so yeah, I, I wrote this poem um, kind, of, kind of as a howl, you know, and um, and I remember it was about body image. It was about struggling with body image and it was written in the first person. And it was kind of my first flight into, into, into the world of fiction, even though it was a poem. Cause I was, you know, I was exaggerating my experience in order to convey my reality, like my, you know, emotional reality. So that was the first time really. And it was really exciting, but it didn't feel like enough. Like I felt like the poem like was like the beginning of something much bigger. Um, but it was, yeah, I just remember hearing that poem and then thinking, oh my God, you can do that. You can go that far. You can, you know, do this crazy monologue, you know, that kind of encompasses the whole world um, and that's cosmic. It was very, very exciting to me that, that um, a voice could do that. I love poetry for that reason. What about, <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 there's something so powerful about it. It's funny, you know, like my, um, my partner was recently saying like, you know, poetry, we don't, you know, poetry, what do we even need poetry for? But, you know, when we, we recently had, had, uh, had, a, had a death in the family and we were all looking, uh, that's the first thing that we looked for was, it's, but it's funny because it's the first thing that you go to, it really is like, is poetry, right? Um, yeah. And that's when you realize just how valuable it is. And for me, it was so valuable, like it was, it was my way in to the world of fiction. It was through poetry. I just, there's something about the, it's just, it's like, it's like incantatory, right? It casts a spell. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, I, I think a lot about um, religion and like, and just faith and belief and how, I don't know why it is, but human beings throughout history, we seem to have like been inventing God uh, and like incantations. Yeah are like prayer and that sort of rhythmic spell casting you know it feels similar to me yeah. something throughout and across all the languages I know of <laughs> there's many languages I don't know of but that incantation and poetry just exists in language I find I'm sure it exists in nature I'm sure there's like a biologist oh, that yeah. can tell me that but yeah the repetition <laughs> and the rhythm that we we seem to inclined to fall into yeah <laughs> right well, what was it for you what was your first uh, story experience writing a story and um oh i remember i uh, my uncle gave me a journal um with a padlock and i had never oh. journaled before so i would i was yeah. writing fiction i was writing fake journal entries about just another young woman i was a child at the time like maybe 11 or 12 and I was writing about a teenager yeah so <laughs> that was like my first it was very thrilling it almost felt like I was doing something wrong um 
Yeah, because it was a yeah, lie. The, the padlock would especially make you. Yeah, right, yeah. right. It's, yeah, it's a lie, and and that's so exciting. It feels like yeah, you're really transgressing, right? Yeah. yeah. And the padlock. The, I remember those diaries with those padlocks. Uh, they were so exciting. I want them again. Yeah. No, the, I, my journals are not at risk of being read by anyone, but still I want a padlock. <laughs> yeah. yes. um, so that poem that you just you described, would that have any, like, would, would that have been like the beginnings of what 13 ways of looking at the fat girl would be? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. It was it was my first attempt to write that book, um, really. It's, it's, it kind of held the whole book inside of it. Um, and, uh, but it took so long to, to figure that out because I had just written poetry up until then, really. But that was the first poem that had like narrative in it and had like worlds in it. And I knew there was more there. Um, and, and I couldn't find the form for it for, forever. I, I, I tried writing. Um, I, I used to work for Maisonneuve, um, this magazine in Montreal, and uh, and I wrote a, a personal essay about body image, and that didn't feel right either. And it just didn't feel like it, it was saying all the things that I wanted mm -hmm. to say. Um, and it wasn't it wasn't until I came upon the idea of of just kind of zooming into these different moments, these different kind of d dynamics between. Uh, a woman grappling with body image and, and others who kind of, you know, shape her idea of herself and, and also just like inform her, her experience of being in the world. Um, that I, I kind of, I knew, oh, okay, I have, I have, I have an actual book here. Um, but yeah, that, that poem was the first, kind of like the first fragment of it. It was crazy. So, so 15 years later, I had the book. <laughs> 15 years later. <laughs> Sometimes that's how long it takes. At least, at least I did it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I wonder. I people ask me sometimes if I uh, I share experiences with the characters. Like people, I'll say something about the characters I've written. So I'll say something about my, you know, my early twenties, and and so a friend would be like, oh, like that character. Um, and I always try and describe like it's fiction. This is not me, right? But this is like, these right. are things I know that I can write about. Like we all know trees, and so writing about trees, yeah. you know. And so I'm wondering if that, if, that, if actually all, <laughs> all your books that I've read, if there's, if that's similar, because um, there's some th similar themes between Bunny <laughs> and All as well. Like I, I'm like, oh, this is in my imagination. This is all happening at the same university. <laughs> <laughs> the same school <laughs> just different semesters yes. um but also like the themes of like I don't know female vengeance like righteous vengeance mm -hmm. righteous yes. vengeance <laughs> yeah. um, yes that's yeah. the question it's not much yeah. of a question but yeah no it's a it's a brilliant question um yeah, absolutely. There are like there are these reverberations. I think there's there's a lot of connections. You're absolutely right between Bunny and All's Well. They're both about kind of unbelonging, the experience of of just of not belonging and and how it can manifest, and and two very different kinds of loneliness. You know, in the case of Bunny, you know, Sam is Sam is outside like this world that she is inside of. She's outside of it. You know, and and what does that feel like? And how does how does the imagination sort of offer consolation, but then also, you know, the dangers of that consolation because it can be pretty blinding, right? Um, and then I think in all as well, yeah, Miranda's experience of being in pain, and it's a pain that nobody can see, like most pain, <laughs> you know, um, that we experience. People just don't know. They look at us and they don't know what we're dealing with inside. Um, and and it's lonely, you know. It's lonely. It's, it's especially lonely when you try to communicate it to people, and you can never quite convey it, or they don't want to hear it, right? They don't want to hear it. There's like a limitation to how much they can take on, and there's a limitation to how much they're going to believe you. And there are these little like ways that people undercut, diminish your experience, um, so or they just want to talk about their experience. Yeah, right. Like you did an excellent. Like I was. I started to read it because I got the book. Thank you. I started to read it and I was like, no, I'm not reading quickly enough. So I got the audio book and I was 
I was like, oh my God, of course she's upset. Like, of course, of course. And then the flip side, I was like, oh my goodness, but of course they're exhausted, you know, but more, it just was so, yeah, it was so clear. <laughs> I felt the feeling. So thank you. I mean, it wasn't fun, but thank you. But anyways, I interrupted. Please continue. <laughs> No, no, that's great. I'm so happy to hear that. You know, the um, the the um, person who read the audio um, is the same voice actor, Sophie Amos. She's really wonderful. She did Bunny, and she also did All's Well. And I thought she's I thought incredible. She's, she's really, <laughs> she's very good. Yeah. yeah, she has that kind of dreaminess, but she also has a kind of grittiness in her voice. That yeah, I really love. Um, so compelling. But yeah, yeah, just that, just that she yeah she's got that uh, yeah she's just got something to her voice it's got that kind of life that's just it's really wonderful to hear and and yeah that there's there is something about that kind of just other people just not acknowledging your experience right but i mean how can they is the thing i mean how to what degree can we expect people to acknowledge the fullness of our internal reality, right? I mean, sometimes the stakes are very high, like if you are in great physical pain and people don't believe you. And so I, I was really interested in that. Um, and, you know, it's something I've grappled with. So the book is exploring something that I have, you know, that I have struggled with myself. I've struggled with chronic pain for a number of years. And, and it, it was important to me to kind of to, to look to just look at that experience and 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 explore how it kind of shapes your everyday life and all of your relationships um and yeah and 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 in writing about it i think i found like there's a, there's a lot of just sadness to it and there's a lot of sharp edges to it but there's also there's humor too you know there's like absurdity upon absurdity just trying to communicate pain is is it's it's i mean it's it's terrible when you're in it but it's also funny how you're just grasping for language, you know, because it's, it's it's kind of beyond language, right? Um, yeah. So you're forced to use these like weird metaphors, like the there's a chair man. on my foot, or yes. yeah, I'm a fat man. I, I was so. like, oh yes, this is perfect. <laughs> this is so perfect. Um, just yeah, the yeah. internal because it's all. I didn't consider not to trust her judgment up until yes. way too late <laughs> because I'm like, no, yes. I believe her, I believe her because too many people don't believe her. And then I'm like, wait, what is happening? Right. <laughs> is this happening? <sighs> so much, I think I it's because of Bunny. I think because the very last yeah. line in Bunny, I was like, what is real? And so I, yeah, now I, I know. I'm like, I don't know about you, <laughs> but um, congratulations, because I will be thinking about Miranda forever, I think, um, but your descriptions yeah. of pain, that, oh, there was a description of when the first time she wasn't in pain, that was like chef's kiss, <laughs> uh, where she felt like a blue sky, <laughs> I think, and then golden inside, it yeah. was just so palpable is the word <laughs> um yeah here <laughs> so i know you thought yeah. this would be a regular yeah, conversation was... oh <laughs> no what were you going to say tell me uh, i was just saying i i know you came here for uh, like a proper uh, conversation but i'm just here to gush about all as well <laughs> <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> but yes i interrupted <laughs> Oh, I was just going to say that that the the descriptions of her being out of pain, you know, I wrote those in pain. <laughs> so a lot of that is like somebody somebody in pain dreaming about what it would be like to be out of pain. And that was so fun, you know. Um, and I did have those moments. I did have those moments of kind of like, oh, it's better today. And that feeling of suddenly being free from something that's been kind of just weighing you. And I mean, this is true of emotional and mental pain too. You know, when you have that moment where it's, it's something lifts and it's almost like you, 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 you forget, like it's so quick how we forget. Like I, I remember when I had this terrible fever, I had a flu um, and then the fever just broke overnight. And I will never forget how it felt when it broke. I, it was just like, it was truly, and I think I use this in the book. It was like a roaring that in your head that just suddenly turns off. 
And then the next day I forgot. I forgot about the throes that I had been in before, you know? Uh, yeah. And I was very interested in that, you know? That kind of like, it's almost like they are, I think Susan Sontag said that they're like two separate countries, illness and wellness. And when you're in one, you can never remember the other. I think it's really true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Also her descriptions of, well, your descriptions of her envy of the, the young people's bodies. Um, it was, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was excellent. I don't, I don't know if I'm yeah. a bad person, but I, I, I don't think she did anything wrong. <laughs> I fully support her. Um, I'm so glad that you do. Thank you for that. I, I I appreciate that because I do too, frankly. You know, I mean, she's really she was suffering. You know, uh, yeah. so it's like this, this so much fun. That's like the fun of dealing with like a Shakespearean hero is or a Shakespearean monster is yeah. that you know you have this intimacy with them and then you can really feel their you know feel all their feelings and then when they do the horrible thing you're like I don't know maybe you had reason yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why not? yeah. but I yeah. also think that's a compelling character that's like a, a fully yeah. human character relatable um believable actually yeah um I wanted to ask about I don't know the right term if it's magical realism or I don't know I've recently been learning the, the origins of the term magical realism, magical realism specific to Latinx writing, so I'm never really sure, but there is a very clear blurring of reality. Well, I think it's just imagination and delusion. I'm just like, is this truly happening or is this character having a different time than everyone else? Um, which I love to play yeah. with just, just in terms beyond like delusion, but even emotions, like when I'm a, a childhood friend of mine once said, you know, when you're sad, the ceiling can be on the floor. Like ha that's how strongly my perception of reality is affected by my mood. Um, so even something as simple as like feeling sad versus feeling right. happy versus feeling anxious. Um, but with these characters, I love what you're doing where you blur things because I really dig an unreliable narrator. Um, yeah. <laughs> But it takes a moment, in the, you know, at least in Bunny and all as well, it took me a moment to, to be like, oh, wait a minute. I don't know anymore. Um, I, can you talk about that? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's interesting that you that you bring that, that up, those two poles, right? It really happened. It was all in, in her head, right? I, I think the fantastic, you know, that, that space, it's between them, right? It's between those two things. It's kind of moving between them. And that's where horror is too. It's between those two poles, you know, did it really happen? Is it all in their heads? And I don't want to land on either one because I feel like the minute that you do, you're kind of out of the realm of the fantastic in a way, because you've decided um, for the reader. And I, I like the reader to have the freedom to kind of play around in that very scary world that's kind of flirting, you know, in, in both directions. Um, so, so it was very important to me to keep, keep those, those possibilities, both possibilities open. Um, so that our sense of reality is broadened so that the, you know, and so that emotional reality, psychological reality, which to me always extends beyond, can be explored. That's what the fantastic really uh, has always allowed me to do. Um, and it's so freeing, um, but it's scary because, yeah, you're in this kind of space between. Um, but it's yeah, it's a very exciting space too because anything is possible, and it's a very it's very scary. And that's why I think also I, I, the books have horror in them. Both of them have horror because they're playing in that space. Like that last line in Bunny that you were talking about, that was very purposeful. Oh um, my god. And, yeah, to keep 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 that door open, um, and make the make the reader wonder. And I wonder with them. Like I don't know, I don't know either. <laughs> um, and that's that's a, that's good. That's good. I shouldn't know. You know. I oh, I feel either. that so much. I feel like what you said about letting a reader decide for themselves, and also like just not knowing. Yeah. I so adore that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, would you like to do a reading now? 
Yeah, as long as I hope I don't freeze on everyone. If I do, just cut me off and just start talking. Uh, it's okay. totally fine. Um, okay. Okay. Um, I'll just read the opening uh, scene. So the opening scene, just to give uh, just a little uh, context. Um, this is about a theater teacher. Her name is Miranda. Uh, she's suffering from chronic pain. Nobody believes that she has it. She's hell bent on staging this production of All's Well that ends well with her students, uh, but they're mutinous and they want Macbeth. So in this opening scene, she's on the floor of her office, has to go down to the theater and, and face these, these mutinous students and she's in, she's in pain. So she's avoiding it. Okay. I'm lying on the floor watching against my will, a bad actress in a drug commercial tell me about her fake pain. Just because my pain is invisible, she pleads to the camera, doesn't mean it isn't real. And then she attempts a face of what I presume to be her invisible suffering. Her brow furrows as though she's about to take a difficult shit or else have a furious but forgettable orgasm. Her mouth is a thin grimace. Her dim eyes attempt to accuse something vague in the distance, a god perhaps. Her bloodless complexion is convincing, though they probably achieve this with makeup and lighting. You can do a lot with makeup and lighting, I have learned. I lie here on my back on the roughly carpeted floor with my legs in the air at a right angle from my body. My calves rest on my office chair seat, feet dangling over the edge. One hand on my heart, the other on my diaphragm, cigarette in my mouth. Snow blows onto my face from an open window above me that I'm unable to close. Lying like this will supposedly help me compress my spine and let the muscles in my right leg unclench help the fist behind my knee to go slack so that when I stand up, I'll be able to straighten my leg and not hobble around like Richard III. This is a position that, according to Mark, I can supposedly go into for relief, self-care, a time out from life. I think of Mark, Mark of the dry needles, Mark of the scraping silver tools, his handsome bro face, a wall of certainty framed by a crew cut ever nodding at my various complaints as though they are all part of a grand upward journey that we are taking together, Mark and I. I lie like this and I do not feel relief. Left hip down to the knee, still on vague fire. A fist in my mid back that won't unclench. Right leg is concrete all the way to my foot, which even though it's in the air is still screaming as if crushed by some terrible weight. I picture the leg of a chair pressing onto my foot a chair being sat on by a very fat man. The fat man is a sadist. He is smiling at me. His smile says, I shall sit here forever, here with you on the third floor of this dubious college where you are dubiously employed. Theater studies, AKA one of two sad concrete rooms in the English department. Your office, I presume, rather shabby. Downstairs in the sorry excuse for a theater, they're waiting for me. Where is Miss Fitch already? She should be here by now, shouldn't she? Rehearsals begin well now. Maybe she's sick or something. Maybe she's drunk or on drugs or something. Maybe she went insane. I picture them, my students, sitting on the stage, swinging long, pliant legs over the edge. Young, face, young faces glowing with health as though they were spawned by the sun itself, waiting for my misshapen body to hop speak, about to declare mutiny any minute now. I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, I hope so I came through. It mostly came through. I think there was a bit of glitching. Um, but oh, wonderful. <laughs> Okay, we'll take thank what we can get. Reading. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you for that. It reminded me of another oh, question you. I had, or just like more of a, a thought. And again, uh, participants, you, um, sorry, uh, the audience, you're welcome to ask questions as well. Um, but there was a lot of kind of, I don't know the right word, but you know when you're feeling insecure, and then you're saying you're imagining what people are saying about you. There was a lot of that, um, yeah. and it was so relatable. <laughs> it was so relatable because yeah. it's I 
wow non-stop right and I really was like oh this poor woman <laughs> she just had to deal with so much yeah. misogyny and like ableism yeah. and people not believing her pain yeah. so now it's so internalized um yeah. and I guess again that's not a question <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, I mean, I, I love that headspace. I love playing with that headspace of, you know, you're feeling vulnerable. And so your mind just spins. And if you're an imaginative, sensitive person, it spins <laughs> in terrible directions, yeah. you know, and yeah, you, you imagine what people are saying about you. And it's like, and, and those stories that you tell yourself about what's happening are so funny. I mean, they're sad. They're, they can be very sad because you've internalized all that. You're absolutely right. It's where is it coming from? Is it coming from inside or is it something that you that is external that you've internalized and are now just projecting onto everything, right? Because it's your you're just so used to it. Yeah. And that question of like, is it is it coming from outside? Is it coming from inside? It just, you know, I love that question uh so much. Like in 13 ways, that was really that was the heart of it. It's just I pictured this girl in a dressing room, you know, um feeling insecure about herself and her body and then I picture this knock on the door you know from like her mother the salesperson and all of the stuff that comes with that all of the expectations all of the ways of seeing that come with that and then I just wondered where does her feeling about herself come from is it is it inside the change room happening or is it coming from the, is that that knock on the door and it's really it's both right kind of like informing each other shaping each other so so yeah I love that I love playing around with that, that kind of place in your head where you spin, you know? Yeah. Um, for me, that's maybe that's the beginning of the fantastic is right there. <laughs> yeah, like, yes. Spinning. Yeah, there were moments um, later on where I was like, is that a different voice in, in the character's head? Yeah. I'm sorry, I think, I think we glitched. <laughs> Yeah, okay, I, but while it's it's not glitching, oh no, I'll just ask. No. Oh no, no, that's okay. Um, I ask a question from an audience member. Uh, this is a question from Kim. Um, oh great. Kim says, "I was okay. wondering what made you want to write about the play. All's well that ends well. I loved reading it in conjunction with the book." Oh, thank you so much. And my apologies again um, to, to everyone and especially Francesca. I'm so sorry that you have to deal with this Wi-Fi. No. I hate that we're in this position. Um, yeah, it's, it's a great question. I love the play so much. And I actually, um, I read it uh, when I was grappling with chronic pain um, and I was taking a Shakespeare class and, um, and we had to read it for this class. And I I just had such a like strong reaction to Helen. She was so interesting to me as a heroine because she's so aggressive, but she's so powerless. Um, and I thought that was so interesting, you know, um, that she has no power at the start of the play, but she has all this desire and she expresses it openly to the audience. And that was fascinating. And so I, I, I really wanted to explore her character and, and she's quite an interesting figure. She's kind of like a trickster character, like from fairy tale, you know, um, she has a wish and then she kind of goes about this kind of shady way of getting it, you know? Um, and her wish is very questionable. Like what she wants is, is disturbing. You know, she wants this man who does not want her, um, but she performs magic to get what she wants. She heals a king. Um, and of course the play has this miraculous healing, which is another reason why I probably loved it because I was in pain <laughs> and the idea of a miraculous <laughs> healing was very exciting to me. Um, and so, yeah, uh, I was, I was, in, and also that title, All's Well That Ends Well. There's something really sinister about that idea. Yeah. That, you know, like the it, it, yeah, the all's end. well that, yeah, exactly. I just, it's very <laughs> sinister. And, and and that's what got me thinking about Macbeth. Um, because yeah, do, that's the, they're both characters have the same trajectory. Just one goes down the road of comedy and one goes down the road of tragedy, but they both start off wanting something that that within the world of the play when they first start, neither can get. Um, but they get it, you know, they both get it. And in, in one case, a king is healed. And in one case, a king is murdered. Um, you know, and so, so I, I wanted to put them together in, in, uh, in one book, 
and have the comedy be on stage and then the tragedy be something that this character is just kind of is is inside of and can't control and she's living against her will right yeah but it's a great play for anybody who hasn't read it i know it's it's, it's problematic but it's great i i don't i don't remember it i read shakespeare in secondary school i barely remember i remember macbeth because of the witches um, but I was curious because in the book they yes. talk about how it's like they, they keep saying, yeah, we know it's problematic or, or, you know, Miranda is saying, I know it's problematic. And I'm like, but how? Yeah, <laughs> how is it problematic? It's just, well, I mean, there's, you know, it's just, it's, it's morally very ambiguous, you know, uh, it's just, it's, <laughs> it's just, it's disturbing, I guess. But I, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. How, right? It's just, it's, it's not a very, it's not a neat comedy. Um, you know, she wants this man, and she just goes about just like the strangest routes to get him. And another thing about it that's so weird is that we start off really knowing her. Like at the at the start of the play, she's very open with the audience. She has kind of one of those. Um, you know, like theatrical privilege kind of roles where she's she's really, the audience gets to know her and her desire for Bertram and what she wants. And then after she states that desire, she kind of moves more to the back of the stage and we don't know her as well. She becomes mysterious to us. And I love that trajectory for a character. Like I have this intimacy with her at first and then she retreats and retreats and becomes like more, more mysterious and also potentially villainous. It's hard to read what her motives are, what she's thinking, what she wants, because she's not telling me anymore. Um, and yeah, so I found that there was so much room, you know, um, to kind of interpret, interpret what was happening. Um, so I, yeah, I really like that about it. But yeah, I guess, I guess, yeah, she's not, she's, a lot of people don't like her. She's a very unlikable heroine, you know? <laughs> Um, so that might be another thing, you know. Yeah. And that came across in the book. Like Grace really did not like her. Um, <laughs> but, um, but I, yes. I just, I'm partial to unlikable like female characters or like just deeply complicated and maybe a little bit evil, you know. <laughs> um, yes. I, I don't know why, but I, I appreciate and I appreciate that in both because I just I read Bunny last summer and I reread it before all as well. So they're both of those are really fresh in my mind. Um, but they both have like, you know, uh, protagonists that aren't terribly likable. Like Sam isn't very likable yeah. in both in the, the like no. story, but also as to it also to me as a character, as a human being, as a character. Um, and, and not like they're, I yeah. really, really like them because they're not trying to be liked by me. Um, they're not, they don't, even in Miranda seems very sinister to me and she doesn't seem, she's not trying to hide that. Her desires are also very plain. Um, and, and there's an yes. honesty yes. to that. Um, I guess not, not playing coy, maybe as a turn, not having to yeah. do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I really dig that. Yeah, I love that access. Oh, good, good. Yeah, I and I like that too. I like that. I guess I like that in a book. I like that kind yeah. of intimacy. Like I'm just, they're just the, the main character is kind of just whispering to me like everything, you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's fun, even if it's wrong, because they don't know. Like we're in their consciousness, right? So yeah. yeah, they're they're telling us this stuff, but they're not censoring themselves. So we have complete access. And we yeah. have access to their their villainy and also their heroism, right? Yeah, um, yeah I love that too. I, I like characters that do that. I'm, I'm interested in that. And interested in going into those uncomfortable kind of moments of thought, moments of emotion, you know, that are ugly, you know, that are not so, that we hide from other people, but that we, we experience, you know? Um, that's where I like the, that's where I like realism. Like I, I like that's, I think that kind of realism allows the fantasy to go, you can go as far as you want into the fantastic as long as I think for me anyway, as long as you have that core of psychological realism. Yeah. <laughs> can I ask you what you're reading right now? And also, okay, no, before, before you tell me what you're reading, 
if you're reading yes. anything. Um, I guess what kind, who, what informs your style? What, what as in anything, any artist, any art form? I'm curious because it's very, um, it's like, in my opinion, <laughs> in my experience to do work, it's very, um, like, it's, it's given me everything. Like, it's very yeah. generous, <laughs> like, keeping on the honey. What's that called? I don't know, but I love it. Uh, um, and I'm uh, just curious about, um, yeah, your style. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's really sweet. And I, um, I, I, I love, you know, I mean, right now I'm reading Frankenstein. I, I read Frankenstein because I'm teaching class on horror. Um, and I love, I love Frankenstein. I love Frankenstein because we have, we have, we have so many feelings for the creature. Um, and we, we fear for him, but we also, he's also, he's scary, you know? I mean, he's scary, but he is also scared. Um, and so I love the way that Mary Shelley plays with that. Um, it's such a human portrait of this monster. Um, so I, I love, I love that book. Um, I love, I do love first person narrators, you know? Um, and so I love, I love those like really intimate close ones. Like The Remains of the Day is probably one of my favorite books of all time because it has that really intimate kind of voice, you know, um, I love that. And, uh, and I love fairy tales so much. I don't know, they're, they're kind of like Shakespeare plays, you know, they're, they're open. They're open, there's so much room for us to kind of, to, to make connections and to find meaning there. And so I really love that. And I think they kind of give me permission to, again, to like explore emotional or psychological reality using, using tropes from, from, from folklore, using magic. Um, and I, I've always loved that. So maybe that combination of like first person uh, narrations that are really like very uh, nuanced and then those fairy tales um, that have all the magic tricks in them. <laughs> I think that's, that's the, what is it for you? What do you what what do you like to read, and what's what informs your style? Oh, everything I've ever read. I think really. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, these days, I just really I want to read books that well, aren't upsetting. <laughs> yes. Oh gosh. Yeah. But yeah. but like, which is not that they avoid hard themes, but ultimately. I can guess on board, you know, I can just guess on board with it. Um, so that kind of narrows things down right now. <laughs> so I'm reading lots of poetry. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, but good. yeah, I love to, to read about food and people preparing food and just mundane things like um, Teja Cole's Open City has really affected me and like really even though I don't like the main character, I really, well, I really did not want to be at his head for however many pages. Right. He wasn't interesting, but it, it was right. so compelling, that style of like stream of consciousness and really engaging with the immediate surrounding um, and with art, right. with like contemporary, or not really contemporary, but just like with art that exists in our world, having the characters also engage with that. Right. Um, so that was really, really affected me as um, informed my writing, I think. Uh, it was just so interesting. Yeah. 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 I've heard, yeah. I've heard wonderful things, but I've also, I've heard that about the main character too. I've heard, <laughs> I've heard that and I've also heard that the book is really wonderful. So I'm very curious. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. There is something towards the end that is revealed about the main character. Um, has, you know, content yeah. warning. Um, but even it makes him even more unlikable. <laughs> but still, um, I got to sign copy, and I was 22. Wow. I was in Albany, New York, um, and I got to sign copy, and I was so thrilled because he's from where I'm from, and went to secondary school in the same neighborhood as I went to secondary school. Oh my goodness! Yeah, and That's I was just amazing. like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> that is incredible. Yeah. Yeah, but um, 
Oh, well, I'm out to ask you so many things. I think we're running out of time. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, so I'm to pick the, the, the one I really want to know. Yeah. What sure. are you working on now? Um, so right now I'm, I'm finishing uh, a draft of, um, of a new novel. Um, and it's, I'll, I'll tell you just a little bit about it. It's, um, it's about a woman who gets uh, sucked into a very sinister beauty cult. Um, oh, yeah. I'm so excited. <laughs> So it's a, it's, it's got, it definitely has some horror elements and it definitely has some fairy tale elements, um, plays a little bit with Snow White. Mm. Um, yeah. And, uh, and there are red jellyfish. So I'll say that <laughs> they're, they're red jellyfish. I'm so excited. <laughs> it's already the theme yeah. is like all the things I love. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. so another question. Do you, I don't know. I don't know if this is a weird question. Um, and I don't, I've never asked other writers, I know how I feel about like my protagonist. So far all your protagonists are women. Yeah. Is that why? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I guess I just, I had to read, maybe, maybe it's just, I had to read a lot of books. I, I love reading books where, where, you know, men are the protagonists. It's fascinating, and I, I'm interested, but I can't help it. I just these are the those are the those are the consciousnesses that I have occupied so far. I feel like they just choose they choose me, and I just have to go with it. But after this book, which features a, a female protagonist, um, I am writing one about with a male protagonist, um, and I, I am excited. Can I kind of feel feel them sort of? And that'll be fun. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know. I yeah, it's it's true. It's it's interesting. I guess I guess yeah. I just uh, I like exploring that headspace. Maybe um, yeah, because I'm interested in in how I, I, I'm interested in misogyny. You know, I'm interested in how it informs our you know like experience. You know. Um, and that it's it's in every single book that I've written so far. So, um, yeah. and then how we can maybe like subvert or circumvent it, right? How we can like find agency through it, and yeah, yeah, that's interesting to me for sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, last question. You said something, and I have to follow. I have to yeah. go down this rabbit hole with you. You said it's how it comes to you. Is okay. that what your practice feels like? Does it feel like the story comes to you and then you kind of unearth it or are you more like a puppet master? <laughs> I wish it felt like I was a, I wish I it felt like it came to me all the time, um, um, but it, it doesn't feel like that most, most of the time. I just get like something, you mm -hmm. know, and then the rest I have to just kind of fumble along. Um, and then if I'm, if I'm in that place for a while, sometimes it will come back. Um, <laughs> but but yeah, it's it it never feels like I'm the puppet master. It never feels that way. It always feels more like I'm uh, that it's it's more about tuning into something, tuning into something, and whether it's without or whether it's within. That mm -hmm. question always like is kind of open, but mm -hmm. it it's something to tune into, and, and sometimes I'm better at tuning in than other times. Um, but that's how it feels. Yeah, because I hear the voice first. That's the first thing that happens is like there's a voice of a character and it mm -hmm. either comes or it doesn't, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then it's all about kind of getting that, getting that voice down, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's how, that's how Samantha came. I heard, I heard her voice so clearly and Miranda's too, very clearly, knew it right away. That always feels like a gift, you know, when you get that, yeah. but then the plot and everything else, that's, those are, yeah, those are the harder, harder things for sure. What about for you? Does is that how it feels or how does it, yeah, do you, does a voice come or what, what happens for you? It's more like a feeling. It's more like, yeah, kind a of, a, um, yeah. yeah, like, um, like a vibe, like a, <laughs> you know, when you're like, what movie should we watch? You know, like a, <laughs> The feeling I want to be in for the duration of a story. 
yeah. and so the feeling that the character yeah. is in and yeah <laughs> but it it does feel like a gift <laughs> yeah it really does doesn't it it's like a whole world right yeah yeah i yeah. love it yeah <laughs> i'm very grateful i'm very i you know like i think of my myself as a kid and i'm like wow i'm so grateful that it worked worked out <laughs> to be so weird yeah. um, and it sounds like you were probably a weird kid too <laughs> yeah I think I was and I just it always helped to it always helped to dream right it always helped to like dream these other places yeah it's like your inner world just feels it feels richer and it feels like there's a place to go um and that's like a just a wonderful thing I feel like if I were just here that would just not be okay with me. <laughs> I just would not be okay. You know, I know exactly um, what you mean. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Oh, thank, thank goodness. You so much. Thank goodness for art. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you for this conversation. I deeply appreciate like you're being candid and, and open about your work. Um, I'm sure the audience also appreciates it. Um, yeah, I'm such a huge fan. <laughs> uh, is there anything oh, else you, you want to say? Thank you so much, Francesca. This is a wonderful conversation. <laughs> oh, is there anything else I want to say? Before, um, like, before I sign a fall? <laughs> and just, uh, just thank you so much uh, for the conversation. And uh, it was such a pleasure. And I hope we get to meet in person. I'm so sorry that we didn't get to. So I I hope we'll get to cross paths and 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 thank you everyone for joining us and and thank you uh to the uh, ottawa public library and the festival for hosting us it's such a pleasure thank you yes i look forward to real life events <laughs> um thank yes, you my goodness do i yeah <laughs> um thank you to the ottawa public library um, uh, the Ottawa Public Library is offering programming for Orange Shirt Day on September 29th at 7 p.m. Join Jenny Tanasco and her daughter Anissa Tanasco for Kibadaj Kidan Danizim. My apologies, I'm very sure I've pronounced that incorrectly. Um, I believe that means we are still here uh, through storytelling. Jenny and Anita are members of the Kitagan Zivi and Nishnabe community, and they will share some thoughts and reflections on how Canada's residential school system has impacted First Nations communities. Um, so please tune in for that. Um, so yes, thank you everyone for joining us and immense gratitude once again um, uh, to the Ottawa International Writers Festival. Thank you everyone. Thank you.